Hey everybody, welcome back to Critical Care Survival Guide. Today I want to talk about a topic that is one of my favorite things to talk about in the ICU and that is when to extubate patients. I've found that sometimes knowing when to take the endotracheal tube out is harder than knowing when to put it in because there's much that goes into making this decision. I'm going to try to break this down into five key elements that will help you when it comes time to get those patients off the vent. The questions I ask my team when I'm rounding in the ICU uh, begin and end with how are they doing in terms of their respiratory mechanics. The ratio we look at is a ratio of frequency, that's number of breaths per minute, over the tidal volume that the patient's breathing. This is also called the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index, or RSBI, RISB as some affectionately call it. The RISB was validated in patients that had an endotracheal tube coming out of their mouth and they had blow by oxygen, what's called a T-piece because it kind of looks like a T. And the patient and this setup would have to be doing all of the effort on their own. The ventilator is not connected to the patient, so the patient is doing all the work plus a little more. They're having to overcome the resistance of the endotracheal tube to breathe. This is called a T-piece trial. And in patients that had a RISB that was less than 105, on a T-piece, they had a very, very high incidence of successfully being extubated, the RISB. In reality, we don't have patients on T-pieces very much when it comes time to extubating them. We often extubate them off of a very low setting. Say, for example, CPAP and pressure support. CPAP's typically about five and pressure support anywhere from five to 10. When patients are on CPAP pressure support, they're getting a little bit of extra help with each breath. So the RISB number of 105 may be a little bit too high. The lower the RISB, the better. Typically in patients on CPAP pressure support, five over seven, if you're seeing that their RISB is less than 60, in my opinion, that's usually a pretty good sign that that patient is taking big enough breaths at a low enough frequency, telling you that their respiratory mechanics are ready to be extubated. Remember, the RISB is just one of the five. Uh, number two, Secretions. Secretions are a huge issue for patients that are getting extubated because they are going to have to cough and clear those secretions. If you're having a lot of thick secretions and a high amount, that's one more barrier to a successful extubation. So I typically ask my nurse, my respiratory therapist, how are they doing on the secretions? And if they say they're having tons of secretions, that's another thing I keep in mind because if this patient doesn't have a very, very strong cough, if they're weak, Maybe they um, are having trouble lifting their head if it's a neuro-injured patient. Maintaining uh, clearance of their airway through cough and clearance of the secretions can be a big problem. So it's a question you want to ask before you excavate. Number three, how's their hemodynamic stability? Patients that are still on vasopressors, patients that let's say have cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and you're still diuresing them and they're still having soft pressures, as soon as you take away the positive pressure ventilation, a couple of things happen. Number one, their afterload actually goes up. Number two, they're going to be more awake because the sedation is coming off, so they may get more tachycardic, more, more anxious, and that may push them into uh, tachydysrhythmias like AFib. So I like to have atrial fibrillation well controlled. I like to make sure the patient is adequately diuresed. Uh, I like to see them off pressors as much as possible. Sometimes you have to extubate on low doses of vasopressors. If everything else is lining up, that's probably okay. But um, if you're on higher doses of vasopressors, if you're having tachydysrhythmias, probably not the best time to extubate. Number four, following commands, mental status. And the big one I look for here is can you lift your head? Lifting your head is one of the key things a patient needs to be able to do to protect their airway, right? Because part of coughing is taking a deep breath in and then moving forward, coughing and expelling those secretions. Patients who can't lift their head off the bed, whose mental status is really suboptimal, they're very high risk for getting re-intubated. So this is definitely one of our big five that we look for. Uh, we like to have patients following commands, lifting their head, and it ties into the fifth criteria, which is the underlying issue. Is it better? The reason that they got it intubated, pulmonary edema, have we diuresed them? 
wicked pneumonia requiring antibiotic therapy and clearance, um, is that better? Is it due to a, let's say, neurogenic problem, like a seizure, and they're post-ictal, but now they're awake? Is that better? Is the underlying condition improved? So as you think through which patients you want to extubate, this is just a quick way, five things to kind of run through in your list. I like to ask my residents and my interns, uh, what are the big five before we extubate? And we like to try to check each one of these. If you don't get all five checks, you still may extubate, but you want to be paying particular attention in those patients. I'll throw one other consideration on here for you guys to close out, and that's something called the cuff leak check. Cuff leak. Patients that have been intubated for more than five days are at increased risk of developing tracheal edema or swelling. Women have a higher proclivity for this to happen. One thing I ask my respiratory therapist to do is to put the patient on a volume mode, so a guaranteed volume, and then we let the air out of the cuff after we've suctioned them out. And we like to see a couple things. We like to see and hear that an audible cuff leak, so air is coming into the lungs and then coming back out around the tube and coming out of the patient's mouth. You can see and hear that. Secondly, I look at the ventilator and I wanna make sure that the tidal volume that is exhaled drops by at least about 100. If I see those two things, then I feel pretty good that they don't have bad tracheal edema. If I let the cuff down and the tidal volume doesn't change and I don't hear or see any cuff leak, well then I'm worried that they've developed some tracheal edema and I might consider giving them some steroids, or at least if I do extubate, be very vigilant watching to see if they develop strider or some post-extubation complications. Thanks again for watching. Congratulations on extubating your patient.